Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's spiritual gathering for Chuila UCC. My name is Jess Peacock, and I am the pastor here. And if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. I would like to let everyone know of two important items coming up on our calendar. The first is a joint um, online Ash Wednesday service with a few other UCC churches, such as Colville and Westminster. I will be uh, sending more details about that event out through email and Facebook next week, so stay tuned. And the second is that for Lent, I will be doing a, a weekly online study of the Hebrew Bible, or at least parts of the Hebrew Bible. It's a lot of ground to cover in a few weeks, so I'll, just, I'll be covering certain books and certain ideas and, and certain historical academic aspects of the Hebrew Bible. But probably not the whole thing, but it'll be, uh, it'll be about five to six weeks long. Uh, it'll be sort of similar to, uh, if you remember last year, that new the New Testament study uh, I did. So also stay tuned for more details about that as well. And with that, let's get into our call to worship, which is uh, this week a call and response that can be found on the launch page. And your parts are um, in bold. Pulling back the veil, the love of the divine spirit uncovers what is hidden. Where evil has left its mark, wounds fester, untended. Roots of destruction still reach deep. But God strengthens the weary and steadies those who are afraid. Divine truth is a balm. Before healing, there must be honesty. Before repair, a reckoning. Let us welcome what is needed to restore what is broken. Today's scripture passages are both being read from the Inclusive Bible, and the first is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 21 to 31. Did you not know? Have you not heard? Was it not told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? Yahweh sits above the vaulted roof of the world, and its inhabitants look like grasshoppers. God stretches out the skies like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent for mortals to live under. God reduces the privileged to nothing and throws the rulers of the earth into chaos. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root on earth then God blows on them and they wither, and a storm wind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom can you liken me? Who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and ask yourself, who made these stars, if not the one who drills them like an army, calling each by name? Because God is so great in strength, so mighty in power, not a single one is missing. How can you say, tribe of Leah and Rachel and Jacob, my destiny is hidden from Yahweh, my rights are ignored by God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? Yahweh is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. This God does not faint or grow weary, with a depth of understanding that is unsearchable. God gives strength to the weary and empowers the powerless. Young women may grow tired and weary, young men may stumble and fall, but those who wait for Yahweh find a renewed power. They soar on eagles' wings, they run and don't get weary, they walk and never tire. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, to you, and to me. Thanks be to God. Our gospel passage is from Mark chapter 1, verses 29 to 39. Upon leaving the synagogue, Jesus entered Simon's and Andrew's house with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told Jesus about her. 
Jesus went over to her, took her by the hand and helped her up and the fever left her. (laughs) Then she went back to work. Um, After sunset, as evening drew on, they brought to Jesus all who were ill and possessed by demons. Everyone in the town crowded around the door. Jesus healed many who were sick with different diseases and cast out many demons. But Jesus would not permit the demons to speak because they knew who he was. Rising early the next morning, Jesus went off to a lonely place in the desert and prayed there. Simon and some companions managed to find Jesus and said to him, Everybody is looking for you. Jesus said to them, Let us move on to the neighboring villages so that I may proclaim the good news there also. That is what I have come to do. So Jesus went into their synagogues, proclaiming the good news and expelling demons throughout the whole of Galilee. The gospel that transforms. May it be so. Now today, I'm looking at our passage from Isaiah. And the historical context for this portion of text is the Babylonian exile, which we've talked about a few times. Around 50 years prior to the time of the writing of this passage, the tiny nation of Judea had been razed to the ground. Their temple for Yahweh was destroyed, and the Hebrew people were taken into exile by the Babylonians for what basically amounted to a generation. Now, in hindsight, we can look at sort of the long arc of the biblical history of the Jewish people and see that ultimately they eventually returned to their land and rebuilt. So it was all good. But in the cosmology of the time, a defeat like this was not only a defeat of like one people by another people, This would have been viewed as a defeat of one people's God by another God. In the eyes of the people of that time, it would have appeared that the God of the Babylonians, named Marduk, that God soundly defeated the God of the Hebrews, Yahweh. As a result, the faith of the Hebrews in their God had been shattered. And we can see in various writings from the Hebrew Bible, the mental and the emotional and the the spiritual turmoil and trauma that this caused. So it makes sense that the Hebrew people would be thinking negative and difficult thoughts about God such as it's written in our passage today. My destiny is hidden from Yahweh. My rights are ignored by God. But as much as we can read the questioning and doubt of the Jewish people in the book of Isaiah, there is just as much reassurance within the book as well. I find Isaiah to be so very human in its content. Honest lamentations and anger and pain, but also genuine praise and joy and hope. Difficult and conflicting feelings and emotions interweave in this work, just as it does in our own lives and hearts. And Isaiah chapter 40 is a good example of this. Despite the cries of the people at this time feeling like they are being ignored by God or that their God had been defeated, the writer wants to reassure their people that the divine spirit is still with them no matter what. And they write, Yahweh sits above the vaulted roof of the world and its inhabitants look like grasshoppers. Now, if you ever watched, I may be dating myself, but if you ever watched the mid-70s TV series Kung Fu, the main character, Kwai Chang Kane, 
was called Grasshopper by his master as a reminder that, at least compared to his master, Cain knew very little. And he had a lot of growing to do. And because of that, he should trust in his master. And we could definitely apply that concept to this passage of the divine looking down on us and seeing us as grasshoppers. That the divine wisdom is so beyond ours that we should just trust in it. However, while a passage like this is meant to comfort the reader, you know, serving as a reminder that God is larger than our problems, depending on the toxicity of your own personal religious history or upbringing, one might, though, hear in this passage, God is way bigger than you, and if you don't shape up, God will squish you like a bug. Now, if you don't think that when you read it, it's easy to dismiss and say, well, of course not. That's not what it means. But again, depending on your sort of spiritual background, what, in, what religious environments you came out of, it could be very easy to see God as sort of this threatening authority figure. Now, my own personal theology of the divine is of a... Uh, and, and this theology has evolved from that more toxic authoritarian figure, but my current personal theology of the divine is of a spirit that is embedded deep within a community, deep within community. A spirit that feels our pain and shares in our joys and not of that external and disconnected heavenly power sort of looking down on us uh, like a disapproving moralistic authority figure. And so when I read this text, I struggle a little with the imagery of God sort of sitting above it all, viewing us as, well, insects. However, the use of grasshoppers as that imagery of our relationship to the divine, I think is interesting for a couple of reasons, and not just negative. Because grasshoppers, if you've ever read about them, and I did some reading about them this week, they are pretty amazing creatures. You know, they have five eyes. They have ears on their bellies, their, their, their sort of flashy, iridescent wings ward off predators. And they have an ability to communicate complex information by sort of rubbing their back legs together to make songs, songs that we've all heard. That is a grasshopper communicating with other grasshoppers, which is pretty, pretty dang cool. But grasshoppers also have the capacity to be very destructive. When certain conditions occur, such as sort of the overcrowding of a grasshopper population, ordinary grasshoppers can actually transform in color and in body size and in temperament to become locusts. And where they these locusts turn into massive swarms, sometimes up to 80 million bugs that then can wipe out grain harvests in entire regions, resulting in uh, famines and, and, and destruction. Just last year, you might have remembered, in the Horn of Africa, Hordes of locusts decimated the livelihoods of farmers, and they are creating food shortages and assorted health and environmental issues for that area. Now, this is all to say that I would suggest that perhaps the writer here of Isaiah isn't using the grasshopper metaphor to comment on our relationship to the divine, or how the divine sees us, but rather the writer is commenting on the capacity for human beings to 
show our beauty as well as being destructive, which is what the grasshopper represents. Perhaps the comparison is less about being squished like a bug by God or God watching from a safe distance, and, or maybe it's more about remembering that we are part of a larger ecosystem, a larger community, and that the divine intends for us to behave as the creative and beautiful grasshoppers rather than the destructive locusts. I mean, if 2020 taught us anything, it's that we as a species hold within ourselves the capacity for incredible selflessness and compassion, but as well as shocking cruelty and destruction and indifference to the needs of others within our community. That might explain the movement in this chapter where the writer of Isaiah moves from grasshoppers in one verse to, the, uh, uh, to addressing the privileged and the rulers of the world in the next. Those in power. And here the writer is probably referring to King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the Babylonian ruler, who you know, was responsible for the deportation of the Jewish people into Babylon. But those in power are notorious for overreaching the, that power granted to them by the people to the detriment of the health and well-being of those people. We see it all the time, right? It's not that the divine will squish us like bugs if we don't do enough. That might be how we operate as a people whether in foreign policy or our justice system or through parenting or even through our, well, probably especially through our system of capitalism. But there's too much compassion and care weaving through this week's text to think those things of the divine. Rather, we're reading of a weariness, of a struggle, in body and spirit that emerges out of collective trauma and sorrow. And we read of the divine intervening with the tools at the divine's disposal. Vision, creativity, a compassion for those who are at the end of their own strength, at the end of their basic needs, emotional needs, as well as physical needs. The divine doesn't relate to us as capitalism does, or, or as our definitions of success within the culture would have us believe. The mandate of the divine is not do more, be better, keep pushing. It's something more like be kind, create communities of solidarity, turn toward the things that promote life for everyone. Because we betray the image of God when we deny this to others. When we act as the locusts versus the grasshopper, there is no comfort, there is no compassion, there is no healing. There is so much pain in the world. And while the divine spirit and the divine spark within us meets this pain with compassion and connection, we are also invited to leave behind everything that continues to threaten our well-being and that of our neighbors for a transformative world where those who are not winning, where those who are growing faint and exhausted, they are strengthened and empowered.
the work of imagining a different way to exist in this world is difficult and it's wrought with resistance. But according to Isaiah, the divine is entirely with us in that work. May it be so. Would you please join me for today's benediction? As we face together the challenges and possibilities of this era, may we remember the love of God is attentive, not avoidant, patient, but not passive. It is biased toward justice, urging and luring and drawing all life toward liberation. The love of God will be known through those that practice care, that manifest courage, and move us honestly and humbly together toward freedom from evil. May it be so among us as the Spirit companions us with peace. Thank you all, and have a wonderful week.